Todd Staples, good morning and Merry Christmas, brother. Good morning, Jason. So good to get to visit with you today. Well, this is, it's funny because, um, and I've said this to a couple of other guests, you know, some people I meet on the podcast for the first time, but then there's also very dear friends that I have that whenever I very first started the podcast, I made a list of people that, okay, you know, I've got this network of people that I really like and admire and have done some really cool things. And Todd Staples was on that list. And if you'll remember, like when this was still just an idea, I texted you and you said, yeah, man, anything to help a buddy. And so to finally come full circle and get you on here and now mint you a Texas Titan, well-deserved. I appreciate you making the time, my man. Well, you need more people on your list besides me, Jason, but I'm, I'm honored to do it. You've always been someone who has rolled up their sleeves and look for ways to make the state better, the community better and country better. And so um, I think that's why you and I have hit it off because we, we both share that, that uh, desire and uh, sense of responsibility to try to try to make things a little bit better. Well, I appreciate you saying that, and that's a perfect segue to begin because for those who may not have uh, been swimming in the political waters that you and I did for so long, which, and, and by the way, man, this will please you to know that the Texas Titans podcast is not political. As a matter of fact, it is a political politics free zone. And so I think you're only the, well, you are the third former state senator to be on, but politics is not the uh the the topic of the day what it is though is what you just said i mean todd if anyone has led a life of service for this state in particular it is you state represent well let's go all the way back you were on the palestine city council weren't you i actually was i was um, i made a mistake way too early in life i was 25 years old jason and we had some challenges for an older community, uh, um, you know, the downturn in the economy. And I got out of college, came back home to Palestine, was working hard, trying to get a business going. And my former high school FFA teacher and advisor called me up and said, Todd, we want you to run for city council. And I said, thanks, but no thanks. I'm, I mean, I'm trying to get a business going, trying to get a family going, and I, I just can't afford to and can't do it. And he got real quiet on the phone. And I'll never forget what he said. He, he said, we gave to you, and it's time for you to give back. Wow. And so I told him what all former FFA students tell their high school ag advisors to the day that, that we die is that I said, yes, sir. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, giving back is really what it's about. The, the blessings that we enjoy have come to us from the struggle of former years. I fully recognize that. Um, I, being born in the United States of America means that we didn't start out at home plate. We, we, we got to start out on first base or second mm-hmm. base because mm-hmm. this country that has been built is, um, is truly amazing, particularly when you look around the world. I've been very fortunate to to travel and see and i've been to uh, countries that uh, people are struggling and you know it's their form of government uh, that that, you know this is a politics free zone and i appreciate that because too many people put too much faith in politics today rather than just the real real core things that really drive us and um, we're fortunate to be americans and i i hope we don't lose that in our generation Well, I cannot agree with you more. And one of the things that you said there that a lot of people don't realize, you know, when I was on city council in Tyler, they doubled my salary every year. And I'm sure it's probably about the same in Palestine, which uh, for the listener, again, that doesn't understand, you you make no money. It it is a volunteer position. You have to you have to volunteer to become elected. And, you know, whenever you're running for local office, it's funny. Those who support you, they think you're the smartest guy in the room whenever they're uh, campaigning for you. And then you're the dumbest guy in the room once you get elected. It's a really interesting <laughs> dichotomy. <laughs> and, and you know, if you look at a course of a person's career, probably both of those are true at some point. Absolutely. From the, from both Abs- spectrums. <laughs> Absolutely. So you serve locally, and then you go on to the state house, state senate. You become our ag commissioner in, at statewide office. And so, Todd, along the way, and, and just so you know, here's the main thing. Here are the main things I like to bring out in the Texas Titan podcast. It's 
those things that inspired your leadership, those leaders who inspired you, and then those times whenever faced with difficult situations that maybe you failed, maybe you succeeded, but the tactics that you adopted along the way to, to be that servant leader, to gather people around so that you could move them towards a cause. I want those hacks, those tools that you have gathered and developed along the way to come through. So as a city councilman, you decide to run for the state house. What in, was it just that, that desire to continue leading? Was there a pivotal moment? And what was that, what was your decision-making process to take it to that next level? You know, I, I think it all stems from just a value system that I was fortunate enough to be introduced to or, or early on in life. I mean, I had the, I had the greatest parents in the world, lost my dad uh, about 10 years ago. My mother's still with us, thankfully. And, um, you know, two people that uh, worked hard, were honest, um, and uh, um, introduced me to a faith in Christ that, that and God's word is, is something that I, I take very seriously and think that should guide us. Um, my, my mother uh, carried us when I was in the fourth grade uh, to uh, my dad had to be in the DC area. And um, so we went all over Arlington cemetery. We, we saw the national monuments and it really left an impression upon me about the men and women that have sacrificed sometimes everything. You know, when you look at the soldiers and the, and the, and the graves that are there uh, so that we could have something pretty special. And so I guess there is never a, a moment in my life, Jason, where I said, OK, I want to do X, Y or Z. I've never been very goal oriented from that perspective. Mm -hmm. But when there's a need, you, you know, we're always taught to step up. If the trash needed to be taken out around the house, you get up, and you take out the trash. If right. guests are coming over, you get up and you welcome them at the door. And that's kind of been my philosophy in the businesses that I've run or the offices that I've held with all of our staff. You know, if um, if the trash needs taken out, you do it. If the governor is coming through the door, you get up and welcome the governor. That's everybody uh, can do just about anything, but you have to be motivated and do it. And so uh, that, that's that's kind of the philosophy. I was fortunate enough to be involved in in FFA kind of as I mentioned earlier and there's a there's a motto that we were taught early on and earning to live living to serve um, and, and that's kind of what it's about learning to do and doing to learn and you know those are the types of, of words that I was introduced to as a young person and so I, I get asked a lot of times from from people that want to run for office and I ask them well why do you want to run you know, if their answer is because I want to be elected, I, that's kind of the buzzer goes off in my head. Right. Because I've always operated on the philosophy that if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in your community, then people will want you to go on and do something else. Right. And so that's that's kind of the philosophy that 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 I see. If you help, an, you know, Zig Ziglar once wrote or said something to the effect: if you help enough other people get what they want out of life, you'll get everything you want, you want out of life. Right. And man, what, what a great philosophy that is. Could not agree more. And then, so you get to the state house, you get that big giant pay increase of $250 a month. So man, you are really just racking it up in politics. Tell me about some of the, when you got there, who became early mentors and how important are mentor, have mentors been throughout your career, Todd? Because I got to believe, and again, the, the trajectory that you followed going from local business owner, city councilman, and by the way, you know, we share a, a background in real estate. As a matter of fact, at the Texas Association of Realtors, I was always kind of like, you know, oh, look, there's the next Todd Staples. And I'm like, man, that's, a, you know, don't put that on me, you know, but I was honored. Uh, but nevertheless, so you follow this trajectory. When did you start having mentors in your life and who were some of those folks and what are, what are some of the the things that you remember, like you mentioned Zig, which I consider, you know, God rest his soul, Zig Ziglar. I got to see him one time live and he's kind of what I would call a virtual mentor. I've got people that I read, I read everything that they've ever written just to glean the wisdom that they, they were able to share with the world before they before they left or some of them are still alive. And I just, I watch them from afar, but 
when you get to the state house and you have all these big characters that are that are that are there, I mean, there's nothing like the the Texas state legislature. Who were some early folks that you go that was somebody that kind of taught you how to navigate the waters and 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 take on that leadership role, which you eventually would. You were. Uh, it's like I talked to Kevin Eltif about whenever he was on here. You are one of those guys that it didn't matter if you were on the left, you are on the right, somewhere in the middle. You had the respect of your colleagues as someone who did have their focus on the right things for the people of the state of Texas. Who were some mentors that helped you develop your leadership style and your way to approach the the, my, the myriad of issues you were faced with as a leg, as a legislator? Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Jason, when it – there, there's kind of two twofold of, of mentoring. There's what you absorb and what you put your put in your mind from your reading. And, and I think uh, looking at leadership skills and leadership philosophies are very important from Zig Ziglar to John Maxwell today, yep. who does a fabulous job of really articulating, um, you know, the simple principles that treating your neighbor as yourself is, is really a philosophy that should guide you. And so that's, that's certainly um, an important part of it, but I've, I've, um, I've seen people that I've respected that have given back and that have been a part of making things better for, for quite some time from, you know, people in my local community, uh, Jim Mixon, who, you know, is a name you probably won't ever read about, but was someone that was a music minister at our church growing up uh, and a youth leader that really uh, taught us about the importance of principle and uh, faith and, and doing what's right and getting involved to, you know, when I started paying a little bit of attention to politics and saw the kind of leader that Elton Bomer was, my state representative, who, you know, although was a Democrat, was very responsible for George W. Bush being elected governor of Texas because he he helped George W. in his very first race. And I, I, that always impressed me as someone that sought good leadership and then put the work ethic behind it to get it done. And so you know, I, and I saw Elton serve in the legislature and I, and I saw the effectiveness that, that he brought to the table. And so he's someone that certainly, um, you know, stepped up in my mind. Um, I mean, I got to meet uh, President Bush 41 early on. And, and, I, and I noticed, you know, I, I know we can all have differences of political philosophy, but I really noticed something very sincere about President and Mrs. Bush. And that was their sincerity and care for people. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, that's something that you, you never should forget, whether you're in public service or private service, you're running a business or you're working for a company. It's really about people and it's about treating them right. And, and uh, that's, that's what I saw from them. I, I got to hear JC Watts speak one time, you know, uh, uh, even though he's from Oklahoma, yeah, he's wow. still a pretty good guy. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, great uh, f uh, talent on the football field, obviously, but who went on to serve in Congress, and you know, who was very practical in his approach and talking about success. It's not the kind of car you drive or the size of your checkbook. It's really about who you are and what you can give back, and those are the types of things that really resonated with me, I guess. Now, as now, just because uh, you know, as in the legislature or in business, we're all faced with those very difficult decisions. And I think at the legislature, it's more, def it's just more defined. I mean, you just, it's more visible. You know, you've got you get just two uh, sometimes contrasting sides, and but and for a lot of times for the constituency, they see just the high level you know, what's kind of presented in their face, depending on which side they're on, they don't see kind of the underpinnings of what's really going on. So therefore, you have to be, you have to be so thoughtful about the decisions you're making. Todd, whenever you had to approach, and still to this day as, a, as, a, as an executive, as, and we'll get into, when you were faced with those decisions that uh, like kind of like the Ronald Reagan, well, if I can get 80% of what I want, then I'm going to go ahead and do it. What was your calculus to try to figure out, gosh, I know I'm going to make a lot of people angry because as a politician, you just can't make everybody happy. As a business owner, you can't make every customer perfectly happy all the time, no matter you strive to. What was your process for 
making those decisions to say, okay, I've made I've made my call. I know what's right, and and and, you, and sometimes it's look. You have to go sell it. It's just like business, you know. Uh, what what is your process for the for the hard decision making? You know, I I guess there's there's several tests that that you can have. I, I always like Phil Graham's Dickie Flat test, you know, to where he looked at the small business person and you know, tried to make a decision. Does this make it easier on that small business person that's creating jobs, that's paying taxes, that's trying to keep this economy moving forward, or does it make it harder? Uh, I, I, you know, I apply that to my own life. My father, uh, uh, his baby bed was a shoebox. He worked in a factory for 36 years. He started a business later on in life. And I always kind of thought, man, are the decisions that I'm making, making it harder on people like him that are work hard, trying to do what's right or, or does it make it easier or does it make it harder? So I tried to look at those things in terms of, um, you know, what really is government's role as well. And, and, and you know, you, you mentioned mentorship earlier and I, and I, and I don't want to skim over that because I think today in the 24 seven news cycle we live in, Jason, <clears throat> there are every bright star, has a dim corner in it somewhere. I mean, there's, Amen. there are Amen. human flaws. Yep. And so, you know, the, and, 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 and it's so polarizing today, you know, we, we look at people and if you say, well, wow, they said something that impressed me, you, you know, you, you get judged by, you know, I don't like that person. And so what, you know, I try to work with people is to make certain they recognize, <clears throat> look for the good and try to emulate that. Yeah. And if there's some things that don't add up, you know, don't get hung up on that aspect of it. Try to try to get beyond that because, you know, I, 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 everybody stumbles from time to time. And as we, we started off saying there's, you're the smartest person in the room and you're the dumbest person in the room. And uh, we've all made decisions in public life and private life and in business life that we obviously uh, would do over if we had a chance, but you can't get hung up on those things. You've got to continue to look forward uh, to be forward looking, forward thinking, and try to make the best decision you can. But, you know, whether it's education policy, you know, I, I, I tried to make a decision on how can I empower parents to get engaged in their children's lives and to make certain that we don't push them out of that process. But, you know, you always also have to recognize Jason, there's a lot of kids that don't have parents that care about their education. Right. And so it's a tough situation when you, you know, your core philosophy is <clears throat> your parents need to be the ones guiding your educational process. And so as a policymaker, I want to make certain that they are the ones that are empowered. And then you have to fill that gap to where, where, where you have kids that, that, that no one's at home when they get home right. and no one is checking to see if they do their homework. And no one is checking to see if they're being respectful of their teachers. And so it's, it's not a, a one size fits all philosophy, I guess. And you, but, but you have to have some core, core things that guide you. And, um, you know, am I, am I making it easier? Am I, am I, am I, am I going to take more from hardworking Texans or am I going to leave it in their pocket more? And, and you try to go through that process as you make decisions. Well, I could not agree with you more. And one of the things I want to get to now that's more of a just so one of the cool things about this little podcast and the great thing about podcasts in general is it's not although it's the Texas Titans podcast and I generally profile Texans, you know, as the title would uh, suggest. But I've got listeners in Europe and, uh, and all over the country that. Uh, I think that they probably listen due to a fascination with, you know, Texas. I mean, like so many have said, Texas isn't a state, it's a state of mind. And those those like you and I who are proud, you know, multi-generation Texans and, uh, and in particular East Texans, which, by the way, you'll get a kick out of this. So the last episode I did was with a guy named Billy Campbell, who is a now a professional duck hunter. He uh, is part of the team that is Dr. Duck. And they're sponsored by Real Tree, and just an incredible guy. And I had read an article before he came on, and it kept referring to him and his partner Dennis Luzier, who's the other part of Doctor Duck, as has growing up in Eastern Texas. 
as though this was some as though Texas is a monolithic state where and I'm like, man, this guy that wrote this article could not have been from Texas. He grew up in eastern Texas as though the only difference between someone in West Texas and East Texas was was just geographical region. No, 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 no. Come on, man. <laughs> so, I found that kind of funny. But but now the reason why I bring that up is because as ag commissioner, now you become a statewide office holder. And so you're getting to go to not only every corner of the state, but you also start moving into one of the things that has made Texas what it is, which is our agriculture base. Very agra- you know, in addition to obviously um, to oil and gas, which eventually you found your way to where you are now. Uh, but tell me, tell the listeners that may not have that intimate uh, understanding of what Texas is, what it was like getting to represent the entire state as our ag commissioner, the people you meet, and just the differences from the panhandle to West Texas to South Texas to East Texas, and God bless you, Central Texas, where you still have to spend so much time even being out of office. Just kind of talk about what it meant to you to get to actually get out there and see Texas boots on the ground like that. You know, when I was running for Texas Agriculture Commissioner, uh, I, my uh, consultant suggested that I make a pledge to visit all 254 Texas counties. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you that is a lot easier to say it than it is to do it. Yeah. Texas is an enormous state, uh, rich in natural resources. We lead the nation in cotton and cattle. Uh, we we're, we're the epicenter of where agriculture technology is, is groundbreaking, literally life saving worldwide by the, the science that's behind making agriculture so productive today. Um, there's a book, I'm trying to think of the name of the author It's called, I, I believe the, t- I believe this was in the Ford of the book, the big rich. Oh yeah. And they talked about Texas and he described Texas, you know, there's the Western states and we really don't fit that a hundred percent. And then there's the Southern states. We really don't fit that a hundred percent, but he, he described Texas as the place to where the, the old South meets the wild West. Yeah. And yeah. I thought that's really who we are yeah. because we have a combination of those Southern roots, but we have that wild, wide open, Western philosophy as well. And I, and I thought that really fits us. And so, you know, to serve as agriculture commissioner is, is just phenomenal. But when you think about the men and women that um, are, you know, like I say, are recognized around the globe for making a difference in food quality and making it available, uh, pioneering um, uh, just breakthroughs that are celebrated here uh, from you know, uh, Texas A&M to Stephen F. Austin and their forestry uh, out to Texas Tech in Lubbock. And when I was ag commissioner, um, uh, Dr. Mindy Brashears was her name. And she was doing research in food science and safety. And I remember her saying something to me along the lines of, I don't want to be in the top 10 programs. I don't want to be in the top five. I want to be number one. And I thought, man, that is, that captures the Texas yep, spirit, that's whether it. you're, you know, you're playing uh, sandlot football in the backyard on uh, Christmas day with your yeah. family, or, you know, you're vying for the college football championship. We have that innate desire to succeed and, 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 and success is measured in a lot of different ways, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but succeeding is, is giving your best. That's part of succeeding. And that's part of success is doing your best, not doing a halfway job, not just getting by, but giving it your all. And that, I think that's who Texans are. And that's what made me proud to serve this great state. And I'm very thankful and fortunate to have had that opportunity. And I'm telling you all 254 counties (laughs) is a big task, but it's awesome. You see the best of Texas, you see the best of people. Yeah. And you see why this state has the character and the flavor that it still maintains today. Yeah. Yeah. No, I could not agree more. And I think that one of the reasons that a lot of people are, you know, flocking to Texas, I know at one time, I'm not, I haven't looked recently, but to the tune of around 1500 people a day is because 
freedom still reigns in Texas. You're, you're, you're free to be who you want to be, you know, and I think it is, it does have that frontier spirit, you know, even in such a modern era as we find ourselves, you know, I think that's one of the cool things about Texas. You know, you can kind of, whatever you want, you know, if you, you know, if you want to help keep Austin weird, go keep Austin weird. If you want to be out, if you want to watch your dog run away for six days, go out to Lubbock. You know, if you want to see some rolling hills and pine trees, come on to the pine, pine curtain that is uh, deep East Texas. It's, it's really a phenomenal place. And so, well, how me, have you go ahead. Let me just touch on that before we yeah. leave that defining Texas. Cause that, you, you, it's such a, uh, a valid point i think we ought, we ought to spend just a, a minute here yeah. i mean whether you're in the panhandle or you're in the rio grande valley mm -hmm. you know that philosophy reigns well and I, I i've tried to think often how why is it that people are moving to texas why is it that we have businesses relocating just as we've heard recently you know from you know multiple large major companies coming here bringing their headquarters here and Certainly it's tax policy. That's important. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. There's the workforce availability that's important to Texans as well. But I'll tell you, after having traveled all 254 counties, after work with policymakers in different states and traveling to different countries and seeing, you know, how they react to situations, there's a philosophy in Texas that's not lost today. And I hope it doesn't get lost in the future. When you think about a regulatory approach, Jason, there are some people that think the government has all the answers and you've got to go in with, um, you know, some kind of strong arm approach. And, and you know, this is something I've learned from my role in agriculture and it's something I've learned from my role in energy. But Texas businesses do not despise regulations. Right. In fact, most people would agree that regulations need to be fair. They need to be transparent. They need to be science-based, mm -hmm. not politically science-based. Right. And as Texans, we don't despise the business community. We welcome their solutions. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is when it comes to finding answers, you know, look, I, you can be a bureaucrat, uh, which I've been accused of being, which I don't know how, but I guess, I, I, you know, even all my, my business experience. And, and but, but what I mean is you can be the best business person in the world, but you, you're not involved in every business, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, nobody should tell cotton farmers and cattle raisers and tree farmers how to raise their product, just like producing oil and natural gas today, unless you're in that business. Right. And so when it comes to solving these challenges from a regulatory perspective, Texans still look to the business community and the public has an ex expectation that the business community has a fiduciary duty to do the right thing, to come up with solutions. And so as we craft these regulatory solutions as a state, we welcome the business community's ideas. We welcome their research and development. We welcome their innovation and technology. We do not push it away. Right. You know, California's electricity rates ha has risen six times the national average from 2011 to 2019 because of a mandated government response. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm really not trying to beat up on California. It's a great, state to go golf in because there's good weather any time right, of the year right. but it's that different philosophy that has enabled mm -hmm. texas to grow to where you know our children have the same opportunities that you and i had growing up to go and do big things and so I, that that's something that always has stuck out to me as being a difference maker and what makes texas unique is that we embrace the solutions we welcome the different stakeholders to the table even if the stakeholders may, may have different philosophies. You know, there, right. there may be some that don't agree with that. Just a quick example. When I was agriculture commissioner, we brought, um, there was a endangered species in central Texas, north of Austin. And we brought the environmental community together with the business community and with landowners who, you know, were fierce believers in protecting the rights of private property owners. And by putting those people in the same room, we actually develop solutions that work for everyone. Yeah. And that can be done if, if you bring people to the table. It's not always pretty, but right. 
you, you can't give up on that philosophy is, I guess, my point. No, I think all of that is as absolutely correct. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm glad you bring it up. You know, Texas is one of these that like, if, if I were back at, you know, my running for office days and I decided to run for the state house, it's kind of like whenever I ran for city council, you know, people ask you, what do you want to do? You know, kind of what is, what is your project list? And in Tyler, I used to tell people when you're running for office in Tyler, Texas, you run with the mindset, don't screw it up. You got a good thing here. Don't screw it up. Don't go in, don't, don't go into office with a bunch of big ideas because just don't screw it up. And I think that's the same thing with the with the legislature, which you're about to have to face, you know, uh, in your business as because uh, they're about to go into session. And, uh, you know, th- to me, it's like if you could just have every elected official just with that mindset of, hey, especially in Texas, we got a great thing here. Just don't screw it up, because if anybody can screw things up, it's elected officials. <laughs> so Absolutely. Just, just don't do it. Well, I would love for you now that you're um, you're out of the uh you're not having to show up and ask for votes anymore instead you're uh uh and, and you are now a voice of a primary economic driver for the state of texas being the uh uh the the is your official title is chief executive officer or executive director just you you run the texas oil and gas association all right and um which is so important from a jobs perspective i mean every portion of our economy is somehow tied to this our natural resources and we are very rich in natural resources as it relates to energy um and you got the legislative session about to start what do you see our biggest challenges and again not not so much getting into an ideological philosophy that you and i you know share uh but we're about to have a new administration that does have uh have contrarian views to a lot of the the way we uh, drill or rather fracking, you know, those sort of things, the way we try to uh, produce uh, energy in Texas. What do you see some of the biggest challenges coming up and just the landscape of Texas, not just in energy, but what do you see in the next, you know, four years, politically and non-politically related, as we have Tesla showing up, we have Google coming in a big way. You know, we had the big Toyota uh, 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 move here not too long ago. Um, and now Oracle is saying that they're coming. I mean, there's all these things that are happening in Texas. From your perspective, both from an energy, oil and gas, the business that you're that you're steeped in, to just overall the economy and kind of Texas's future, what are you seeing? Well, no doubt about it. Oil and natural gas has improved our lives. We hear so many misinformation campaigns today, but. I mean, just think about it. We're living longer. We're living better. We're living more prosperously than ever before because of an available energy supply that is, that has been transformational so that you and I didn't have to go chop wood this morning before we, we got on here, right? Because that energy density and the, the investment from a, a private enterprise perspective, rather than a government owned and controlled perspective has created this this platform for us uh, so that is a that is that's an awesome thing you know we hear a, a lot today about the term energy transition mm-hmm. and if you think about it mankind has been transitioning from energy sources from the beginning of, of recorded history <clears throat> i can tell you today that uh, when i think of oil and gas companies today i really think of innovation and technology companies mm-hmm because they're developing the pioneering breakthrough technologies that are making life better. Uh, ExxonMobil actually invented the lithium ion battery that is, you know, is doing things and this, they did this like 30 years ago. And so when I think about energy and oil and gas and the role that it's played, I, I think there's a lot of um, information that consumers need to know one is that 96% of the products that we use every single day, eyeglasses, um, screens on our laptops and smartphones, makeups, medicines, tires, hand sanitizer, uh, PPE. This is all, they, the foundational building blocks of these items are from oil and natural gas. And so it, it really is an indispensable product. Having said that, there, there, 
we all, there is a global responsibility to care for our planet. And, you know, you mentioned the term fracking. It's been very misaligned. I think uh, the public has a lot of questions about that now. And questions are great. They should be. But I think what the public needs to know that this is a highly regulated process. When people drill for oil and natural gas, there are multiple layers of steel and cement that are used to protect our groundwater beneath us. And that part of the conversation is not included in the commentary that gets regurgitated in social media and in the mainstream media and in, in the in our that we read every night or see every night. And so <clears throat> oil and gas is um, actually the members that I represent, by the way, which are, you know, at the Texas Oil and Gas Association are some of the smallest in Texas to some of the biggest in the world. And it's upstream where the exploration and production goes. It's midstream getting that product from the rural areas of Texas to the urban areas where you need gasoline at your convenience store to the refineries who actually convert crude oil and natural gas into products that you can use every day. And, and the service companies and everybody in between, our combined philosophy is an all of the above approach. Look, if consumers want renewables, that's great. Uh, in fact, some of my companies are big investors of renewable uh, types of energy. They're also the biggest research and development arm. And, and by the way, our world's air quality is cleaner today because of natural gas that has, that is being, you know, shipped out of Texas, uh, to all over the world and it's changing really the the entire global landscape because of affordable reliable energy supplies and so i do think however we're at a crossroads in our nation we have seen the energy industry oil and gas industry in particular uh, misaligned in debates uh, which are uh, short on facts and long on um, misinformation and so I think we just need to get down to a really an educational basis of what this industry does. We can't do without it, but we're all committed to environmental progress. But there's a big distinction between climate confusion and climate hysteria and climate concerns. I think climate concerns are real. I mean, I want clean air. I want clean water. And this industry is really investing in cutting edge technology like carbon capture use and storage they're using artificial intelligence today to produce this product in a cleaner, stronger, better way than ever before. And the future really is bright. If we allow the consumer to be king, which they are, they need to make choices. And, um, you know, we don't shift the ingenuity and um, future of this country to other parts of the world by making bad decisions um, in our local and state and national governments. Man, I tell you what, you, you touched on something there, Todd, that I was um, a little bit ignorant to myself. You know, I had Connor Prohaska on, um, one of your fellow um, A&M uh, colleagues and, you know, former president of the A&M student body, and he works for the Department of Energy. And, uh, you know, DOE has so much to do with uh, private sector innovation beyond oil and gas, just product development, because so much, what you just said, I think it's very, I want to reiterate it for the listeners, so much of what goes into everyday products stems from the oil and gas industry, and so it's not just as simple as the combustible engine, which is what gets all the attention, right, or, you know, or, or coal, you know, coal-fired plants to produce energy for our homes. It's much more than that, so I'm glad you bring that up. Well, kind of to kind of put a bow on all of this. I want to bring this back around to kind of more of a philosophical standpoint because you have had, so, and, I, and I don't say this with, you know, to, to, to blow smoke. I mean, yes, you're a dear friend. I think the world of you, but, but Todd, you've also put the points on the board, you know, both literally and figuratively uh, as a leader. So a couple of things. One, uh, Again, I know we're both readers, and you know, leaders are readers, as Jim Rohn used to say. Um, what are, if, if I were just coming up, I don't care if it's in public service, it's in business, or, or, you know, or, or an executive, you know, you've done all those things. If I wanted to feed my mind properly, what are two, three, one book that you would recommend that people need to grab hold of and start to really saturate their brain with to, to kind of help point them in the right direction? What are some books you like? 
You know, I, I'd I'd pick Proverbs if I couldn't didn't have it. one book in in all the world because it, it really does give you insight for living for yep. for building a business for raising a family on how to treat other people's and so Proverbs is a book that I I would highly recommend. But you know, I mentioned Zig Ziglar already. I think I mentioned John Maxwell. Uh, Doctor Dennis Waitley is another author that I think is um, um, has a lot of good things to offer. Uh, I, you know, I think, I think that, um, it, it brings a lot to the table when you think about those philosophies. I mean, even if you want to go old school to Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, you know, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, uh, how to win friends and influence people, uh, you know, Frank yeah. Luntz, uh, has got a book it, and I sub, I'm trying to remember the title of Frank's book, but the subtitle is it's not what you say. It's how you make people feel. It's what Americans really want, really. Okay, is that the name of it? Good. Yep. I knew, yeah, I know you. I, th I, knew I you think that's the one. I know that's one of his books. I think it's that the one you're referring to. And it's great. Yeah, I I bought copies. I gave that to all my staff when young you know young folks would come see me and thinking about where to try to get a job or what to major in in college. I gave them that book of Frank's because um, you know I think he does a really good job of capturing. Mm -hmm the the important thing that you need to think about when you're uh, when you're communicating with others and yep. you know it, how do you make people feel and yep. how how do you approach that so those are the types of books that's the type of philosophy i think that can guide you pretty significantly well and i think it's really cool that you bring up norman vincent peel because like um, all the guys that i listen to tim ferris ryan holiday all these very bright and accomplished people it's funny how and they've written books that other people are recommend. These, these are New York Times bestsellers, and they will always, when you ask them, like Tim Ferriss, I think um, his favorite, his go-to book that he always recommends is uh, The Magic of Thinking Big by with David Schwartz, which is, that's old school. Same thing, Think and Grow Rich, uh, yep. The Power of Positive Thinking, yep. uh, Zig Ziglar, See at the Top. I am rereading for the first time in forever uh, Og Mandino's the, the Greatest Salesman in the World. Oh, that's such a good, that is such a great book. It's awesome. And it, <laughs> and these are, they never go away. And then also to your point about Proverbs. So my dad, that was the one thing my dad, whenever I was growing up and my dad was not a voracious reader, he, but he always said, read Proverbs every day. And to the listener out there, if you think you're just listening to two Bible thumping East Texas, Jesus freaks, no proverbs you don't even have to be a believer the wisdom is there right. uh in, in proverbs and i and so there's a lot of these uh these writings they they have stood the test of time and it's and it's actually kind of funny and every time ferris or one of these guys talk about one of these old books like the magic of thinking big you know they're old school like dale Carnegie's uh winning friend when how to win friends and influence people that you mentioned it's like they're from the 50s man and it's like yeah. you know you get up and you're a businessman and you, you know, and so it is kind of funny but the underlying principles they're timeless man well, good stuff good stuff well you I, I feel bad because i didn't do my homework i was kind of trying to peek in my library here and see what book titles were well, on i sprung book. it on you there are so many good authors that uh really you know really uh, hit the nail on the head you you certainly captured a few others there thank you for well that. i just i think that you know reading is like push-ups for your brain and uh and so so it's it's something that's all and i think it does it shapes our thoughts i mean it's how you saturate uh, your mind well, all right, now I'm going to ask you one more uh, because now almost universally, whenever I ask people this question, most everybody has read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you're on this program, I mean, I've got a pretty good gauge, and even if you haven't, you've probably heard of the exercise that Stephen Covey does in the book where there's uh, you're walking down the street and you hear music coming from a building. You go, and it's a church. You walk in, and it's a funeral service. You look, and oh, my goodness, it's your funeral. Now, I like I like most people when I was reading it, you know, this is where Covey tells you shut the book and stop and think, what do you want said about you at your funeral? I didn't do it. I kept reading, you know, when I'm reading, I, I just keep reading. But then I'm listening to I'm reading Andy Stanley's book, Visioneering, and Andy talks about how he just skimmed over it. But for this time, he actually stopped and did it. So I was like, OK, well, now that I'm reading Visioneering, <laughs> I'll go ahead and just stop and do what Stephen Covey asked me to do years ago. In that context, because you have had such a um, successful career, success being defined 
a multi a myriad of different ways, right? Um, now, when it's all said and done, Todd, what do you want said about you? You, you know, I, the main thing, Jason, is not about me. <laughs> I mean, I think I think that's important part. And when we get mixed up and confused and start thinking it is about us, is when we get off track. Yeah. And so I I really try to make my decisions and things and recognizing that it's not about me. It's about, it's about others. It's, it's about giving other people an opportunity. It's about, um, you know, and, and so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the way I try to think about it. I really, I really do. And I'm, I'm going to struggle here today to try to answer your question directly other than to say, you know, it's not about me. And I, and I try to make certain that the things that I'm engaged in, uh, reflect that. And I know when you get in the political arena, you got to pat yourself on the back to get people to look at you and say, here's what I believe in. This is what I want to stand for. And this is what I want to do. But at the end of the day, you know, I just think we have a responsibility to give this next generation the same opportunities that we have. Yeah. And, you know, if you're born into wealth or you're born into poverty, it doesn't matter the color of your skin you know, I want a, a Texas and I want an America to where you can grow and you can prosper. And that kind of is what guides me in my decision making. And so, you know, I, I, I used to think about legacies, but the older I get, the more I realize that, you know, if you, if you're, if you're empire building for that purpose, you can get in trouble in a hurry. Amen. And Amen. so, um, I, uh, I, you know, if, if it is said that I did my part while I was fortunate to be here for a little while, that'd be a great, uh, a great compliment. Well, well, I can tell you this, Todd, you're one of those people that um, every time I'm ever around you, I feel a little better than I, and I, I might be in a really good mood, but somehow I'm, I feel even a little better having been in your presence for a bit, my brother. And, uh, and today that definitely is the case. And so I cannot tell you one, I apologize other than at Willie Langston's little get together where we really didn't get to visit as much as I'd like, but we got to catch up a little bit. And then now on this podcast, sometime I would love to, when you're back in East Texas, uh, let's, let's catch up. Maybe we'll uh, even invite Cody Harris and we'll go eat some Mexican food or get y'all over here to eat some Stanley's barbecue and uh, catch up further. But I thank you for your friendship. I thank you for what you've done for, my beloved state of Texas, the leadership you've provided, I cannot tell you on, on behalf of every Texan who has benefited from your your tireless energy, your uh, your resources, both physically and otherwise that you have devoted to this state. Thank you for that. And thank you for this time today. I know you've got a terribly busy schedule and you cut out some time for the Texas Titans podcast audience and for me and for that, my brother, I am truly grateful. All right, Jason. I appreciate you, your friendship and your leadership. It's an honor to serve Texas, and it's great to the team uh, like you and others that that you've mentioned that you've interviewed today that um, that care and want to get the right thing done. And barbecue or making food, either one, I could eat that for breakfast, lunch, <laughs> dinner, midnight snack. So I'm on. Let's be sure we do that. All right, brother. Well, Merry Christmas and thank you, thank Todd. You. Thank you. Bye bye.